And now to an election on the other side of the globe, one that will have a huge impact not only on the Middle East, including the state of Israel, but on every man, woman and child in the United States. It all started when one of my opening statements went viral in Egypt. I called out President Obama for continuing to support Muslim brother President Morsi after more than 33 million Egyptians came out of their homes to protest this so-called democratically elected president. The problem? He suspends the Constitution, imposes Sharia law, puts himself above any checks and balances, creating a theocratic government like the Ayatollah in Iran, and he issues a presidential order releasing condemned terrorists from prison. On my recent visit to Egypt, I met with many government leaders and ordinary Egyptians who were very disappointed in the recent breakdown of U.S.-Egyptian relations. Those relations have been mutually beneficial for decades, from the Camp David peace accords where Egypt was the first Arab country to recognize the state of Israel. It's the Obama administration's feckless foreign policy, the dithering and the doublespeak, and the refusal to support an ally, Egypt, in this dangerous time that creates the type of vacuum that allows terrorists to move in. Those terrorists, now present in Libya, continue to train and prepare for more attacks on the West. Now, Egypt has always given us flyover rights over their country and preferential treatment at the Suez Canal. After 9-11, Egypt shared intelligence and jointly interviewed al-Qaeda prisoners. But most important, Egypt at the crossroads of Asia, Africa and the Mediterranean is geopolitically positioned to provide stability in the Middle East. Yet Obama refuses to give the military support promised and allocated for Egypt to fight al-Qaeda and the terrorists who threatened to destroy that country. Now, Egypt is one quarter of the Arab world, over 90 million people. Should they fall, the West is at risk. And although Egyptians are fearful of al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood and Ansar al-Sharia, 33 million of them were not afraid to take them on. Egypt is 80% Muslim, and most live in peace with the Coptic Christians there. But under the Brotherhood, more than 80 churches were burnt down, countless Egyptians tortured and killed, and more than 1,000 Christians' homes have been destroyed. On my trip, I met with Field Marshal al-Sisi, one of the candidates in the election this coming Monday and Tuesday, who made it clear that religion has no place in government, that Egyptian women should decide whether they want or don't want to wear a veil, that there needs to be a separation of church and state. What most Americans don't understand is that the vast majority of Egyptians hate the Muslim Brotherhood, and they want nothing more than a democracy in their country. They don't care if you're a Muslim, a Christian, or a Jew. They want a government with checks and balances, and they have in fact adopted a new constitution that guarantees equal rights regardless of gender and religion. Now, Egypt, Israel, and the United States, our destinies are forever intertwined. And for the U.S. to not support Egypt in its fight for democracy against the Muslim Brotherhood is to deny our own origin. Our Declaration of Independence says governments are instituted among men deriving just powers from the consent of the government that whenever government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Unfortunately, our president, in true Obama fashion, prefers to ignore the majority of Egyptians who seek nothing more than safety, security, and democracy, even if it benefits the United States and our ally Israel. Mr. President, take a look. This is what the Egyptians think of you.